Good evening or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm Regina Yao, the founder and president of the Pixel Project, and I'm moderating the fourth Google Hangout session of the second annual International Women's Day edition of our Read for Pixels campaign. Through Read for Pixels, the Pixel Project is collaborating with 11 award-winning best-selling female authors to raise awareness about violence against women and to raise funds towards the celebrity male role model Pixel Reveal campaign, which aims to raise $1 million to be shared between the USA's National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the Pixel Project to help keep our efforts to end violence against women alive and kicking. We'll be telling you more about the Read for Pixels fundraiser, which has lots and lots and lots of exclusive author goodies a little later in this session. And you can find out more about the Pixel Project and Violence Gates Women by visiting www.thepixelproject.net. Now, today's guest has written multiple amazing paranormal and urban fantasy series. Her Riley Jensen Guardian series is an amazing foray into the world of werewolves and vampires. And, has and she has just released the first book in a brand new series. Please join me in welcoming Carrie Arthur. Hey, Carrie. Hey, everyone. Nice yeah. to be here. So Carrie has also, I'm, I'm going to keep Carrie on screen because we're going to show you some really cool stuff. Um, Carrie has also don generously donated some very special very Australian treats to the stash of author goodies we have up as perks for donors at the Reaper Pixels Indiegogo fundraising page. And Carrie, get ready. I'm going to read out a list of what's in that special down under goodie bundle. So it has a signed copy of Wicked Embers, <laughs> a signed copy of City of Light, and uh, based on the uh, comments that you guys have left um, underneath um, on Carrie's page, uh, some of you might have ha are having trouble getting a copy of City of Light. So this is your chance to get it. Um, a packet of the legendary Aussie chocolate biscuit or cookie, if you are uh, American, Tim Tam. Where's it? Yep, haven't got those. Haven't got those. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, there'll be an Aussie bookmark with a koala on it. Um, I don't think has it arrived. No, it hasn't arrived yet. Okay. And there'll be a purple koala bag, or rather a bag with a picture of a koala on it. Look, it's really, really cute. And I think you can wrap it up when you're not using it. Yeah, um, it's got a little pouch pack just there. Oh, cool. It wraps up and goes in there. Is that a eucalyptus leaf? Uh, yeah, I think it is. A stylized version. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, Okay, and, and, and the piece de resistance of this is the koala plushie that snores when you squeeze it. <laughs> so, it's the perfect, perfect goodie bundle for all of you who love Carrie's books. You get two latest books, signed and personalized by Carrie. You get a packet of chocolate biscuits or if you're American cookies to eat while you're reading those books. You get a bookmark to stick in it when you, you get interrupted. You have a little bag to carry it around. And if you're at home, you have the little companion koala plushie to keep you company. Um, so Carrie's got six of these fabulous goodie bags available for donors um, and she'll send them worldwide right straight from where she is in Melbourne. She'll send them wherever you are. You make a donation to us. So we'll tell you a little bit more about how to go to our Indiegogo page a little later because, and please give generously because all funds go towards helping stop violence against women or at least keeping the programs and activities and campaigns alive. Uh, to raise awareness, educate people, get survivors connected with resources that they need. Um, that's what we're doing. And that's what the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence is doing. Um, so now, um, over to Carrie, because Carrie's going to do a very special, something very special from the latest book. Over to you, Carrie. Cool. Um, I'm reading the last chapter. Uh, the last section of the, of the first chapter of City of Light. Um, just to let you know, Tiger is our heroine and she's living in a bunker 
underground with a whole heap of ghosts. So here we go. And I apologise beforehand for my reading because I'm terrible at it. Ghostly fingers ran down my arm and tugged at my fingertips. I followed Kat as she drifted towards the left edge of the building, my gaze scanning the old park opposite. The shadows growing beneath the trees were vacant of life and nothing moved, nothing more than the wind-stirred leaves anyway. I frowned, moving my gaze further afield, studying the street and the battered remnants of what once had been government offices, trying to uncover what was causing the little ones so much consternation. Then I heard it, the faint crying of a child. A young child, not an older one, if the tone of her voice was anything to go by. She was in the trees at dusk with the vampires about to come out. An easy meal if it wasn't very quick. I spun and ran from the stairs. The ghosts gathered around me, their en energy skittering across my skin, fueling the need to hurry. I paused long enough to slam down the hatch and shove the bolts home, then scrambled down the steps three at a time, my pace threatening to send me tumbling at any moment. At the bottom, I again stopped long enough to lock up behind me. I might have an instinctive need to save that child, a need no doubt born of my inability to save the 105 children who'd been in my care the day the shifters had gassed this space and killed everyone within it. But I wouldn't risk either discovery or the security of our home to do so. The ghosts swirled around me, urging me to hurry, to run. I did, but down to the weapons stash I'd created in the escape tunnel rather than to the front door. I fastened several automatics to the five clips on my pants, then strapped two of the slender machine rifles, which I'd adapted to fire small, sharpened stakes rather than bullets, across my back. Once I grabbed the bag of flares and threw several ammo loops over my shoulders, I was ready to go. But I knew even as I headed for the main doors that no amount of weaponry would be enough if the vampires caught the sound of either the child's heartbeat or mine. The domed security system reacted faster than mine, the doors swishing open almost instantly. The passcodes might change daily, but I'd been around a long time and I knew the system inside out. Not only had the motion and heat sensors installed throughout the museum been programmed to ignore my low body temperature, but I'd installed an override code for the outer defences that didn't register on the daily activity log. I might be flesh and blood most of the time, but as far as these systems that protected the place were concerned, I was as much as a ghost as the children had surrounded me. Once a laser curtain protecting the front of the dome had withdrawn, I headed for the trees. Cat and Bear came with me, their ethereal forms lost to the gathering darkness. The others remained behind to guard the door. It would take a brave and determined soul to get past them. The dead might not be the threat that the vampires were, but the astute didn't mess with them either. They might be energy rather than flesh, but they could interact with and manip manipulate the world around them if they so desired. Of course, the smaller the ghosts, the less strength they had. My little ones might be able to repel invaders, but they could not hold back a determined attack for very long. I just had to hope that it didn't come to that tonight. City Road was empty of any form of life and the air was fresh and cool, untainted by the scent of humanity, vampire or death. No one, living or dead, was near. So where was the child? And why was she alone in the park? I ran into the trees, breathing deeply as I did so, trying to find the scent of the child I'd heard, but gaining little in the way of direction. Thankfully, Kat seemed to have no such trouble. Her energy pulled me deeper into the park as the stamp of night grew stronger. Tension wound through my limbs. The vampires would be rising. We had to hurry. Bear spun around me, his whisperings full of alarm. Like most of us created in the long lead up to the war, there was no human DNA within his body. In fact, despite his name, he was more vampire than bear shifter and in death had become very attuned to them. They were rising. Sound cracked across the silence, a whimper, nothing more. I switched direction, leapt over a bed of old roses, then ran up a sharp, sharp incline. By the crying I'd heard earlier, the whimper died on the breeze and wasn't repeated. If it hadn't been for Cat leading the way so surely, I might have been left running around this huge park aimlessly. While my tiger shifted blood at least ensured I had some basic tracking skills, basic wouldn't cut it right now. Cat, while not trained to track, was almost pure tabby. Her hunting skills were both instinctive and sharp. The urgency and her energy got stronger, as did bears whisperings of trouble. The vampires had the scent. They were coming. I reached for more speed. My feet were flying over the yellow grass and the gnarled, twisted tree trunks a little more than a blur. 
I crested the hill and ran down the other side, not checking my speed, my balanced tiger sure on the steep and slippery slope. I still couldn't see anything or anyone in the shadows, but the desperation and little cat's energy assured me we were getting close. But so, too, were the vampires. The scent began to stain the breeze, a mix of decay and unwashed flesh that made me wish my olfactory senses weren't so keen. Where was the damn child? I reached for a rifle, unlocked the safety and held it loose by my side as I ran. Bear risked around me again, whispering reassurances, his energy filled with excitement as he raced off into the trees. Second later, I heard his whimper, strong at first but fading as he ran away from us. If the vampires took the bait, it would give us time to find our quarry. If not... I would be neck deep in them and fighting for life. I broke through the trees and into a small clearing. Cat's energy slapped across my skin, a warning that we were near our target. I leapt high over the remnants of another garden bed and saw her, or rather saw the bright strands of gold hair dancing to the tune of a breeze. She was hiding in the shattered remnants of a fallen tree. Beside the tree lay a, lay a man. I couldn't immediately tell if he lived. The scent of death didn't ride his flesh, but he didn't seem to be breathing either. Though I could see no wounds, the rich tang of blood permeated the air, and if I could smell it, the vampires surely would. Bear's diversion probably wouldn't last much longer. I dropped beside the stranger and rolled him over. Thick, ugly glasses tore up his chest and stomach, and his arm was bent back unnaturally. I pressed two fingers against his neck. His pulse was there, light, erratic, but there. But it was the three uniform scars that ran from his right temple to just behind his ear that caught my attention. They were the markings of a ranger, a formidable class of shifter soldier who'd once been used to hunt down and destroy the Desh A divisions and who now formed the backbone of the fight against the others. While it was unlikely this stranger would know what I was by sight or scent, he was still not the sort of man I wanted anywhere near me or my sanctuary, especially not when there were nearly three platoons or, to be more precise, 93, fully trained adult Desh A in the lower levels. The children might have few memories of the hideous way the shifters killed everyone at the base, but the same could not be said of the adults. I shifted my focus to the log and the strands of golden hair blowing on the breeze. Child, you need to come with me. I said it as gently as I could, but the only response was a tightening of fear in the air. But it was fear of me rather than the situation or even the night. Cat spun around me, her energy flowing through my body, briefly heightening my sense of the night. The vampires would be here soon. The urgent need to be gone rose, but I pushed it down. Dragging the child from the log would only make her scream, and that, in turn, would make the whole situation a whole lot worse. Noise was that enemy right now. The vampires weren't the only dangers night brought on. Many of the others tended to hunt by sight and sound. The vampires are coming, little one, I continued, even as though, even though I was talking to scarcely more than a strand of hair. Neither of us are safe here. Jonas will protect me, he promised. Though her words were stilted, there was still nothing in the way of fear and uncertainty in them, which was odd. Jonas is injured and can't help anyone right now, not even himself. I hesitated, then added, we need to get out of here before the vampires arrive. She didn't respond for a moment, then a dirt-covered cherub face popped up from the hollow of a tree. She scared me, then stated flatly, I won't leave without Jonas. I won't. Jonas is unconscious, but I'm sure he'd want me to get you to safety rather than worrying about him. She continued to study me, her blue eyes wide and oddly luminous. I had a strange feeling the child understood all too clearly just what I was saying, and her next words confirmed it. I won't leave him here to die. I won't let you leave him here for the vampires. You have to save him. Child, no, she said, her lip trembling. He saved me, and he'll save you. You can't leave him here to die. I frowned. He saved me? A ranger? Even if he didn't realise what I was, it was an unlikely scenario given rangers had been notorious for forsaking the wounded. And if he did realise, I thrust the thought away with a shudder and simply said, his wounds are fairly serious. Promise me you'll help him. Cat spun around me, her whisperings filled with urgency. If we didn't get moving soon, we'd be dead. Given I had no wish to die, I either had to snatch the child and race her screaming to our sanctuary or do as she wished. The first would attract all manner of trouble other than the vampires, but to help a ranger... I took a deep breath and released it slowly. I might have been trained to seduce rather than destroy, but that didn't alter the fact that shifters had eradicated everything and everyone I knew and cared about. It went against every instinct I had to save this one. And yet the instinct, the need to save this child was stronger still. Okay, I'll help him. 
She eyed me for a moment, a little girl whose gaze seemed far too knowing. You promise? Yes. Kath whispered me. The image of the vampires flowing through the trees rose like a deadly black wave. We had five minutes, if that. Who's that? The child's blue gaze wasn't on me, but rather the energy that was Kat that hovered near my shoulder. She, I raised an eyebrow. You can see Kat? Kat, what sort of name is that? It's short for Catherine, I said. Which it wasn't, but I had no idea where this child was from or how much she knew or might have been taught about the war and the deche. Those who'd created us hadn't afforded us real names, couldn't humanise the military fodder in any way after all. So they used the brutish shifter we'd been designated designed from, and whatever number we were of that breed. Cat was number 247 in production terms. And while I was unlikely our names would be a giveaway, I wasn't about to take a chance, not when there were still shifters alive today who survived the war. Mine's too. She didn't ask me what that was short for. Her gaze went from Cat to me and then back to Cat. She's real. She's not real. You are. She might not have flesh, but she's as real as you and me. The little girl frowned and stood. She was wearing a smock that was grimy and blood spattered and there were half-heeled slashes all over her arms and legs. Anger rose within me and swallowed away. I needed to make sure we were safe before I could allow any reaction to those cuts because those cuts were too sharp, too straight to have been caused by anything other than a blade. How can she have no body and be real? There was still no fear in her voice and no apparent realisation just how close to disaster we truly were. I wondered briefly if she was human. She didn't smell like it, but then she didn't exactly smell like a shifter either. Because not everything that is real is, has human flesh. I clipped the rifle onto a loop on my belt and squatted beside the ranger as cat's energy hit again. Images slashed through my mind, dark bands running through the trees, the hunger surging across the night. We needed to go. Now. I gripped the man under his shoulders and heaved him over mine. Do you have a name? She hesitated then said almost shyly, Penny. We need to go, Penny. I thrust upwards, my legs shaking under the stranger's sudden weight. Holding him steady with one hand, I unclipped the rifle and rested my finger against the trigger. Run with Cat. She'll take you to a safe place. Wait for me there. The little girl's lips trembled a little. And Jonas? Jonas and I will be right behind you. She nodded and scrambled over the tree trunk and ran after the energy that was Cat as she retreated through the trees. I followed. Jonas's body was a dead weight that allowed no real speed or mobility. Bear reappeared, his whisperings full of warning. I ran up the hill as the night around me began to move, to flow with evil. They were close, so close. But there was something else there out there in the night. It was a power, an energy that felt dark, watchful, at one with the vampires and yet separate from them. An instinct suggested I need to fear that darkness far more than the vampires who swept towards us. I cursed softly and pushed the thought away, one threat at a time. I needed to survive the vampires before I worried about some other nubilious threat. Bear, I need your help here. His energy immediately flowed across mine, allowing me to see everything he saw, everything he felt. While this level of connection wasn't as deep as some we could achieve, any bond between the living and the dead could be deadly. All magic had a cost, and all of which had once warned me. While my ability to link with the ghost wasn't so much magic as the mix of psychic abilities and my own close call with death, it still taxed my, both my strength and theirs, and it could certainly drain me to the point of death if I kept the connection too long. But for certain situations, it was worth the risk, and this was certainly one of those risk situations. There was at least a score of vampires out there, which meant this wasn't the usual hunting party. If I'd been alone, if I hadn't promised to keep Jonas safe, I would have shadowed and run. The vampires might sense me in this form, but if I became one with the night, became more, little more than dark matter as they could, then it was harder for them to pick me out from their own. I knew that from my time in the war, when the vamps had overrun a village I'd been unsigned to. But I had promised, and that left me with little choice. Using the images Bear fed me as a guide, I raised the rifle and fired over my shoulder, kicking the burst short to conserve ammunition. The needle sharp, sharp projectiles bit through the night and burrowed into flesh. Three vampires went down and were quickly smothered by darkness as other vampires fell on them and fed. The scent of blood flooded the night, mingling with the screams of the dying. I crashed through yet another garden bed, my sink, feet sinking into the soft soil. A deeper patch of darkness leapt from my throat and the pungent aroma of the dead hit. I flipped the rifle and battered him out of the way with a butt, then switched it to my other hand and fired to the right and then to the left. Two more vamps down. 
I left her a fallen branch. Jonas's weight shifted, making the landing awkward and losing his pressure to speed. Sweat broke out across my brow, but I ignored it, grabbing the ranger's leg to steady him as I ran on. Bear, I said, voice little more than a pant. Bear, light. Ephraim fingers tugged at my bag of flares by my side and lifted one. Energy surged across the night and light exploded. A white ball of fire surrounded by a halo of red. It was bright enough to force them back, but they didn't go far. They knew, as I did, that a flare would go only give me a minute at most, and they knew, like I did, that a little ghost probably wouldn't have the energy to light a second flare so soon after the first. I ran on as hard as I could. The dome's lights beckoned through the trees, all on stars of brightness that still seemed too far away. The flare guarding our back began to sweater, and the black mass surged closer. I fired left and right. The nearest vampires swarmed their fallen comrades, while those at the back flowed over the top of them, hoping to be the ones to taste sweeter, fresher flesh. Thirteen vampires left, if I was lucky. It might as well have been a hundred for all the hope I had that they dragged me down. Sweat stung my eyes and dribbled down my spine, and my leg muscles were burning. But the end of the park was now in sight. The old tower's searchlight suddenly came on, hanging free from both the tower and the dome, supported by ghostly forms. Their sunshine-like light swept City Road and provided a haven of safety if I could get to it. Fifty yards to go, just fifty yards. Then the, van the flare went out and the vampires hit us. And that's it. <laughs> Yay! Thank you so much. And, and they're having, they're having a, a for some reason. Some reason. Um, so, guys, just be patient. We are echoing right now, in a way. Um, okay, so um, before we begin the discussion session, um, could if you are wa watching this, and I know a bunch of you are watching this live right now, welcome. Thank you for joining us today, for joining Carrie and us today. Um, if you look to the left of your screen, you'll see a pop-up which, which um, allows you to type in your questions. So please start typing them in now, and then we'll answer your questions as we go along. So if you've got any, if you've got any burning questions you want to know about Carrie's characters or series or what's coming up next for Carrie, please leave your questions here. Um, it's your chance to get your questions answered live by Carrie. So, Carrie, so here's the first discussion question of the day. Um, in all your series, like the Riley Jensen Guardian series, um, the women are tough and sassy and they've been through a lot in their lives. And they still, you know, if they go down, they go down swinging, but more often than not, you know, they remain standing, you know, bruised and was for wear, but they're still standing, you know, they've got so much determination and courage. Um, where do you get the inspiration for your characters, for your female characters, and do you consciously write them that way, in the way in which I described? described? Uh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, because when I was a teenager, uh, I used to read a lot of fantasy and sci-fi novels and the female characters in them were always the ones that were falling down and needing rescuing and it just drove me insane. Um, so I, when I started writing, I just wanted to write strong female characters that were the ones doing the rescuing and, and swinging right alongside the guys. Um, so yeah, it was a very conscious choice to write strong heroines. Oh yeah, you're the, you're like the second author who said this. Um, in a, in a uh, Tamora Pierce, who's a young adult author, in her in a Ask Me Anything session on Reddit's fantasy subreddit, uh, someone asked her this question, which inspired the question that we've asked you. And she said that it's the same thing. When she was growing up, there weren't any, you know, all the children except for Anne of Green Gables, I guess. Uh, Exactly. And the spunky one, she's really feisty. Um, they, they all seem to need rescuing, and yes. she, you know all the female characters needed rescuing, and she didn't like that. So she started writing her own stories in which you know they didn't need rescuing; they rescued themselves. Um, and you know, years and years later, we we get fa uh, she gets fans telling her that it's great we get to see girls in kids books are rescuing themselves. So in your books, we see women who are no nonsense and who just you know they come out swinging. It, yep. 
Yeah, you, you put them through the ringer, Carrie. Every time, readers go, "Oh no, what's going to happen next?" And you know, no, they couldn't possibly survive that. No, and then right at the end, yeah. Hey, a heavy. I, like, I really like torturing my characters. <laughs> Is it is it easy for you to torture your characters, or do you feel at some point, no, I really like this character. Maybe I shouldn't torture her so much. Uh, no, that's never occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> I like reading stories where you're just never sure whether the heroine or the hero is going to survive, and so that's what I do. <laughs> Okay, so um, so moving on to our next question, and everybody just remember to put in your questions if you have them. You know, we'll be here for another half an hour. Um, so Carrie's here to answer any and all of your questions. So if you, it, it's really easy to type in your questions. Just you know, you if you're in a pop-up box or if you're if you're watching this on your um, browser, you you it'll, you'll automatically see that sidebar on the side of your screen. Just type it in and click submit, and it'll appear to us. So we'll, and I'll read it out to I'll read it out to Carrie, and Carrie will answer it directly. Um, okay. So recently, with a fewer over um, Game of Thrones, the issue of a gratuitous use of rape and other forms of violence against women in pop culture has been raised and discussed publicly, and people have been going at it hammer and tongs. You know, some saying um, it's fiction. So, and it's based on the War of the Roses. So, of course, it's really, you know, violent. Oh, and others saying, you know, no, it could have been portrayed differently. And it's been going on and on and on, especially with the new season coming. Um, so how do you think authors can tackle issues of violence against women in their stories appropriately and portray female characters that survive violence in complex, well-rounded ways that do not re-victimize them? It's a really difficult question. Um, I actually, I'm one of the few people who refuses, I actually have never seen Game of Thrones and I refuse to watch it for the very reason that I do think the, the violence in it is a bit um, over the top. Mm -hmm. um, I just, yeah, I just can't watch it. Uh, as for fiction novels, um, I think you can't gloss over it. You've got to... Um, you, you've got to have the consequences and what happens to the characters as well, and you've got to address that, all those in your fiction to make it more realistic, and have and have you know, characters seeking help, whether they be through friends or or family or whatever. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, no, we we asked you that because um, you know your characters are so tough and they keep fighting on and on and on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, in some books, it's like, it's like, you know, oh, yeah, so this happened to them and suddenly they're like, no consequences. It's like it doesn't affect them. But with your characters, you really spin out, you know, it's, it's like dominoes. It, you really spin out. So this happened. This violence happened. And so the, these are the consequences. But it's not just one set of consequences. It, it's kind of like ripples. It sends ripples through to everybody. So... Yeah, it's it's a, it's a tough one because um, some authors can't seem to do that, um, and we get you know characters are raped but no consequences or or you know they remain the victim just just there as a prop to show how the male character is suffering. I mean, one fan, uh, one one uh, fantasy fan actually called it you know to support man tears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but do that. So that's why I asked the question. It's so interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's consequences in real life, and it doesn't just affect the person who's suffering the violence, but it it, it fans out across the family and friends and everything like that. So you've got to you've got to address it, and it, it's got to be realistic. So yeah, it, it's we usually say you know at the Pixel Project, we usually when we're educating people, we actually say. It's not just someone getting beaten up at home. It's not just domestic violence at home, even though it takes place behind closed doors. So if you see your mom getting beat up by your dad, it affects you. And then when you go out into the world um, and you have relationships, it affects your relationships. And in yeah. communities where uh, domestic violence is rife, 
the entire community is immediately affected because it's sort of like a culture of you know ignoring violence and the, and um and something like um uh, there was a study done uh, that came out last year they did a longitudinal study and apparently a domestic violence costs globally costs something like if i remember correctly okay pardon me everybody if, if this is wrong we'll, we'll put a we'll correct it later but um if i remember correctly it's 9.5 trillion dollars yeah lost in uh, economically um, because of domestic violence. So like you said, it, it ripples out. Um, yeah. So uh, moving on, so do you think it's important for influential authors such as yourself, I've read all over the world, to make a conscious effort to include uh, characters, both male and female, in your stories that show readers the importance of respecting women as equals and as human beings? But, and how do you do it without being too heavy-handed or preachy? <laughs> Again, another hard question. Um, as a teenager growing up without those role models, I'm, I'm sort of very conscious of trying to have men and women on equal standing. Um, so I don't treat them differently. Um, they just, they're just capable and you know, strong, normal people with, you know, good relationships or bad relationships or, yeah, you know, I, I just make it normal that women are as strong as capable as as men and hopefully people who read that will say yeah I, you know i can i i can be strong too so mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> it becomes more inspirational for yeah 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 i think the more you read it the, the and more people talk about it uh the more the situation will improve eventually yeah so we're seeing so the you know, science fiction and fantasy and I think insurance books, young adult, what they call young adult books now, um, they were and still are in some ways very male oriented. You know, we see more male characters, we see uh, more male heroes, but that's changing with writers like you because um, we notice that in paranormal and urban fantasy and young adult now, it's, um, it's very heavily female. So we're seeing what um, one fan on Tumblr, she said, she calls it the Hermione effect now in pop culture and young adult books. And uh, you know, people like Katniss um, and Hermione who are capable and complex and they have agency. Um, what do you think? Do you think it's a trend or, an, or do you think it's an indication of a sort of a permanent change that's here to stay and, and keep growing? Um, I actually think it's a realisation from both the publishers and the, to some extent the movie people that uh, females actually actually want role models, you know. We're a huge part of the audience and we want people we can look up to and say yes, you know. It, it's The guys have had that for years and years and years and it's about time we had it too. So, yeah, I, I, I think and hope it's a change for the better a realisation that, yeah, women want good, strong role models as well on the screen and in their fiction. Yeah, uh, and um, you have your Aussie filmmaker, um, you made the latest Mad Max yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, that was a bait and switch in a very good way because Mad Max is really Australian. And, yes. Uh, and uh, George Miller is a, is a stupendous director. And, and uh, the latest one, I went in, uh, do you see, I went in expecting like loads and loads of, you know, male stuff. Because I was, I will confess now, I was bored on a Friday afternoon. I thought I, I'd take a break and, and I went to see, and I came, and, I, and, and you know, and suddenly it was the, one of the best feminist action films. Of, I would say Furiosa is, right up there with Alan Ripley. And, oh, yeah. And, Amazing. Oh, it's just fantastic. And the way that they link, you know, environmental problems with, you know, uh, getting up uh, with violent patriarchy and the matriarchy striking back and showing the cost of striking, of finally pushing back. It was, Starlight yeah. very violent, but, you know, in, in many countries, 
it's real. You know, if you push back, you're gonna, you might even lose your life. I mean, we just had reports coming out of, of South, uh, South and Central America, you know, active uh, feminists and environmentalists losing their lives. So, in Australia, is it um, how is it in Australia with attitudes towards violence against women? And I mean, George Miller's Australian. He's obviously tackling the issue, and you're tackling the issue with us. So, what? How is it? What's the pulse like in Australia with, with this? Uh, well, I mean, there is a lot of violence against women in Australia, but um, there's also a lot of pushback. It's been getting a lot of um, media attention and a lot of people have been saying, you know, enough is enough, we need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. So the newspapers are, are, are reporting on it and, you know, a lot of um, media personalities are saying it has to stop. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it, it's been tackled, but, of course, you know, it's going to take a while, I think, before it filters through. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, We've been getting, uh, uh, at the beginning of the year, the uh, end of... 2015 and beginning of 2016 there was like a because we curate a lot of um we curate the the news about violence against women and we share it on our channels and there was a rash like a whole rush of headlines from australia about new new laws being put in about strangulation and you know and we're thinking yeah it's really good it's it's taken a while but it's about time um yeah so you have a question from the audience Ooh. <laughs> and it's it's as tough as my questions actually. Our questions. Oh dear. <laughs> so it's from it's from Paula Lieberman. Hi Paula. Um, Hi Paula. And, hey Paula. Um, and she she asks, um, what are the limits for what you write about? Um, that is, there are writers who won't write sex scenes. Writers who write sex scenes but not female female ones um writers who won't write a book that doesn't have a happy ending etc so what are the limits that you have uh, what topic limits approach limits your topics and approach do you have any limits uh i do mm -hmm. i never show violence against a child on on the page um i mean i've written books where children have been killed or hurt, but I actually never physically show that violence on the cage uh, page. Um, I'm well known for sex scenes, but I will I won't ever write a female female or male or male um, because it's not something I know. So uh, I just don't go there, even though I've had many uh, gay characters. But um, I will never show sex scenes because it's just it's just not something I'm familiar with. Um, but other than that. Uh, pretty much as long as whatever happens I show the consequences um, I'll go there okay so we will have another question from the audience Hang on. Anusha hi Anusha um, hi. so she says um, do you think contemporary male audiences are accepting or able to consume novels and films that feature female protagonists? There are men who seem unhappy with this shift. What do you think we can do about this? Um, I actually think a lot of the time it's more the covers on, on the fantasy novels that uh, stop them from reading it because they just don't want to be seen reading something that's obviously female orientated. But I've got a lot of male readers on my Facebook. There's a lot of men that come in and talk about the books and how much they love the books. So there's definitely male readers out there. I think they're just um, hiding in the closet a little bit. <laughs> and now that we have e-books, um, they can yeah. just pull it up on their device and not... Someone was remarking about how um, now that they're e-books, it's easier for her to read children's books about, because no one can see the cover. So no one can see that she's reading kids' books. And I'm like, well, why are you, uh, um, you shouldn't be ashamed of reading kids' books because nowadays, uh, kids, it's just, it's just an explosion in young adult uh, and children's books that are really, really good coming out. So yeah. I guess with e-books, you um, we might have gotten a boost. But I think what Anusha was uh, also probably remarking on is also the fact that the, the the, the new Ghostbusters movie is coming out soon, and it's all oh, women. Awesome. <laughs> it's all women, and um, yeah. and uh, there's this, uh, and it's been the talk of the internet 
because um, the YouTube page that Sony Pictures put it up on, um, there was so much sexist attacks from fanboys in the in the comments, and some of them even proudly declare that they've registered multiple YouTube accounts. They just set it up so they could download it, and some of the some of the sexist, really misogynist comments underneath. You know, it's really off-putting, but. You know, we've watched it, and it, it looks fun. You know, it's not something to be taken seriously, but it's nice to see female scientists and and uh, women doing it for themselves, you know, going out and kicking butt. So, you know, what do you think of... And, and, and the reaction to Mad Max, Fury Road, was similar. You know, when, they, when they realized, the men who walked in realized that... Not all men, okay? Okay, hashtag not all men. We don't like the hashtag, but, you know, it has to be said. Some men walked in and they got the shock of their lives expecting testosterone, but not the way it turned out. So, I mean, what do you think of that with, with that sort of reaction? Well, I mean, uh, most movies have been aimed at guys and, and um, fanboys for so long that um, I think it becomes a huge shock when they actually <laughs> don't get that. Um, and Ghostbusters is one of those movies that it's, it's been, you know, it's, it's just part of history. So I, I guess when you tamper with the formula, you're going to get that regardless. Same as Mad Max. Uh, what I liked about the reactions of both movies is a whole lot of men came in and said, no, this was a fabulous movie with a strong female lead, um, you know, quit that stuff. So as much as you've got the fanboys saying, um, you know, we're never going to watch it, this is horrible, stuff like that, you also got the other men coming in saying, you know, no, no it's a good movie, it's a, she's a good hero. So um, I think it's getting better. Okay. So, Nusha, I hope that answers your question. So if you, all of you who are watching, if you've got more questions, just pile them in. Carrie's here, we're here. We can go on for a little bit longer. If you've got questions, just pile them in. Um, so we're talking about geek culture now. So what do you think um, needs to be done to make geek culture as a whole, whether it's films, comics, gaming, or books, more welcoming for women and girls? Because we get reports coming out of cons, conventions going, you know, they're getting harassed, um, and we've got reports of all male panels or majority male panels um, you know, over, uh, women on those panels not being able to get to say anything. And I mean, what these are just a few examples. I mean, what, what do you think could the geek culture can do to make it more welcoming for women and girls? Ah, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really hard one because for so long it's been a male dominated culture. So you're sort of fighting against history. Um, I think it's just a case of women have just got to hang in there and say, you know we're a part of this and we're going to be a part of this and, and just keep fighting the good fight because i think that's the only way you're going to break down barriers is to to, to keep fighting and, and keep saying we're a part of this and we're going to remain part of this but it's going to, you know it's going to be hard yeah i mean do um some genres feel more male dominated than female i mean even within fantasy and science fiction you know they have different sub-genres and Kelly Armstrong was talking about how in urban and paranormal fantasy it's, and YA fantasy is so female dominated so it feels very comfortable there but I mean in your experience when you go to conventions um, have you ever run up against you know any sexism at conventions or do they go out of their way to make you feel comfortable or do you think women you know what do you think? Um. Well, I've never had that problem in Australia, mm -hmm. and never. Um, I mean, I, I, we go. I go to Conflux and the National Con here, and um, it's been really good. Uh, I don't go to many cons in the US. I usually do romantic times, mm -hmm. uh, which is a reader-based event. So you, you're not really going to get that that same sort of feel. Uh, I have been to World Fantasy Con in Britain once. And uh, I, I didn't strike that there either. Everyone was uh, really good. So, yeah, it hasn't been my experience, but I know people who 
have mentioned that they've struck that problem. So it's definitely still there, but it, I think it's got to get better. Okay. So now you're a mum, you have a grown up daughter, and one of the most important things that anti violence gets the anti-violence against women movement is focused on is changing cultural mindsets and attitudes by working on ensuring that the next generation grows up more egalitarian and less violent than previous generations. So as a mom, how do you think parents can help raise the next generation of men to be respectful of women and girls and the next generation of girls to become women who you know, who know their own worth? Because it's so hard for so many of us women to know our own worth and it takes us many years to do it. But yeah, it's actually a two-part question, your sons, uh, male uh, boys and girls. So what do you think? Um, I think kids learn a lot from the way uh, parents treat each other uh, for a start. But I've also, I mean, I've got a daughter and I've also raised her to be strong, uh, as in, you know, um, it's her body. She has the right to say yes or no with her body and to do what she wants. Um, and no one has the right to force anything on her. So, I mean, that's that's what I've tried to emphasise with my daughter. And um, I've, I've tried to have a, a really respectful relationship with the, with the guys in my life, you know, my family and, and my husband, who's now my ex-husband. But we had a really good relationship while she was growing up. So, um, yeah, I think... You've got to, they learn by what they see and what you tell them. So it's got to be a good mix of both, I think. So it's basically, you know, don't don't have to do as I say, not as I do sort of attitude. Yeah. But yeah, uh, kids, say, kids are kind of like sponges. And yes. They sort of, you, you think they're not observing you, but sometimes they come out with stuff and you say, oh, my goodness, that sounds like me. On yes. a day. <laughs> yeah. 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 So if you're in a bad relationship and you know you, your partner's physically or, or even verbally abusing you, kids will soak that up. And if it goes on, they think, well, that's normal and that's what they expect. So you've got to um, you've got to set a good you've got to have a good relationship and you've got to be open and honest with your kids. I think. Yeah. And what you describe, you know, it, it is what we call the cycle um, of domestic violence and intimate relationship, uh, intimate partner violence, where you, and and you can see families where it's been going on for generations, simply because you all think it's normal, yeah. um, and it takes. You know, it takes a lot of effort to just break the cycle. They always call it breaking the cycle um, by realizing that what's happening is not normal and it's not right and there is a different way but it takes it, it takes a lot of uh, self-awareness to do that and hopefully more people are doing that now you know maybe someone who's listening to us now might start thinking about about it you know it's it never hurts to think about you know where you where you get your the role models for your relationships are so um, we are coming up to almost the end of the hour. We've got another 10 minutes. So if anyone has any questions, leave them now. Um, we know your questions, just leave them now and we'll try and finish answering them all. But um, have you heard of the Bechdel test? No. Okay. <laughs> so this is just a little preface for my next question, which is the Bechdel test is, was created by Alison Bechdel in the States, and she's a MacArthur Award winner, uh, grantee. And she, basically, it's, it's um, a, if a film or book passes the Bechdel test, it means that there will be at least two female characters, and they'll be talking to, having conversations that are not about a male character, but about something else. Because as we were chatting, you know, as we were discussing for the last half an hour, you know, it's been science fiction, fantasy and, and pop culture has been so male dominated. So even female characters start talking about, you know, what their conversations are often references to what male characters are doing. Um, do you do you do that in your, do you think you achieve that consistently in your books? And do you think it's important for authors to 
make sure that their books pass the Bechdel test? Um, I think it just depends on the story, actually. Uh, I've had um, some of my characters in my books don't have many female friends. Uh, City of Light, the current one, she hasn't got any female friends other than the ghosts. Um, mm -hmm because that's what the story requires. But um, my Dark Angel series, um, my female lead in that had a, a very good female friend and uh, it, they grew up together and they supported each other and they talked about everything that was going on in their lives. So, yeah, I think it's important, if it's, it's um, but it depends on the story too. Okay. No, that, that makes sense because, yeah. it, you know, it, it, some stories are set set in walls that are very heavily masculine and some are set in you know just just set in walls where you know it's more diverse um so we're coming up to the end of the session um so we have one last question for you well two parts of the question so you have been so very incredibly supportive of our read for pixels campaign and our anti-violence case work as a whole you know with koalas that you're going to trot out again oh so cute um <laughs> <laughs> We're going to show you what the koala does in a bit. Um, so, um, one, uh, question A under this, um, why do you support the cause to end violence against women? Um, because women have the right to be safe in their own home. Uh, we have the right to walk down the street without fear. Uh, and it, it really makes me angry that um, people who mistreat animals are often given harsher sentences than people who men who mistreat their, their partners and um, the only way it's going to stop if is if we all get together and say enough this has to change yeah and and uh, the interesting thing is you mentioned um, mistreatment of animals is that a lot of abusers when you look back at their psychiatric history they are, they are, if they have documentation of their uh, history of their behavior behavioral history they abuse animals as kids, you know, mm. and and all the warning signs are there. It's just that they weren't scooped up in time. But animals do suffer as well, you know. Everyone suffers when there's an abuse in the house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is, you know. There, there's um, there's this case in France where this woman had been. Um, I'll send you the link after this. Actually, it's in the New York Times and. Um, it's shown a light on how domestic violence is treated by the French legal system. This uh, woman had been married to her husband since she was 18, and he was a horrific abuser, raped all their daughters, abused their son so much he committed suicide, just as she got fed up because he woke her up by sm slapping her face and demanding dinner. You know, 45 years, after, 47 years after they married, and she got fed up. She went and got the rifle, hunting rifle and she shot him three times in the back, killed him. And they put him in jail and everyone had to lobby yeah. for her to be released because yep. this is self-defense. This is and and like you said, it's just not enough. The sentences are not heavy enough. And like you say, consequences. We we've been talking throughout this session about consequences. Yeah. I guess until the real life consequences are heavy enough, people you know, it's, they're not going to be stopped, are they? I mean, yeah. 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 There's got to be consequences and there's got to be more education too, I think. And starting from a very young age, you know, you, you, people have got to talk about this and, and say, you know, it's just not good enough. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's one last question from the audience. After that, there's one last question from me. Oh, this, is, this is a doozy. This is great. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, Carrie. It's really great to hear you talking about this because, like I said, um, everybody, Carrie's our first ever Australian author joining yeah. this campaign, and it's really great to hear, you know, all the way from down under uh, about what's happening then. Also, Shopna Bag um, asks, "What do you think we can do to change or shift cultural attitudes to female roles in a family?" For example, from an Indian background, I was raised to be independent and strong, and yet still have to listen to father or male family figures. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, 
cultural changes, I mean, they're going to take a, to a long time. Um, I, I, culture changes is one of those things that come down through generations, I think, more than um, it's not something that's going to change overnight. Um, like her kids will probably be more open and, and stronger than, than what she's got because she's, she's growing up a certain way with certain restrictions and she'll treat her her daughters and that differently so cultural changes is one of those things um that's very tough to fight against but i think it comes down to education again um you know not just the kids but the generation education as well yeah uh, i shop now i think i can give you a timeline for it funnily enough okay in my own family, my great-great-grandmothers had bound feet. And my great-grandmother had her feet partially bound, so they were released when bound feet were eradicated as a cultural practice. And she ran a business, and then her daughter, my grandmother, um, was illiterate. And then because she was illiterate, she made sure that all eight of her daughters, my grandmother had 11 kids, eight girls, that they all finished high school. And because my mother didn't get to go to college, university, she made sure that her daughters got to go to college and university. So my generation, all my female cousins, you know, I went, um, I have female cousins who are very, uh, yeah, who are doctors, who work in the oil and gas industry, which at a, a very high post, and oil and gas is very, very male dominated. Um, yes. Yeah, I went to Oxford because my mother didn't get to go to any yeah. university, and she. So it took Shopna. It took the, my family roughly one hundred years, one hundred twenty yeah. years, and it's it, and all each generation can do as. Carrie said, is to do better yeah. when you're raising the kids, to do better than the other generation. So now I'm teaching my little niece that it's normal and it's, oh, and it's normal and it's exciting to see female characters um, in all her favorite movies, um, in all books, and, and, and that is normal. And it's not normal to be yelled at that you know you're a girl and you can't take part in stuff. The hashtag, you know, fight like a girl. So she loves to fight like a girl. <laughs> Carrie, Carrie's absolutely right, Shopna. So hopefully this will give you some hope. Just keep pushing. Just keep pushing things along in your family. It can be done and, and it's not easy because you will get pushed back. But yeah, so anyway, the final question for Carrie, really final question is, um, how can authors like yourself best support of efforts to kick off social change to end violence against women? Um, support, by supporting the organisations like yourself mm -hmm. and, and by speaking out against it, you know, talking about it. Um, yeah. I think that's the best way. Yeah, so, it, it, you know, Joe Hill talked about telling the right stories. Do you think that's that's a good point about telling the right stories in books? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Having, having strong female characters who, who, who won't back down and who will stand strong. I think that's very important too. Yeah, yours yours are definitely going down, but they don't usually go down swinging. They actually remain standing just barely, just barely at the, at the yeah. end. And it, and, it, and it really makes, you know, it, it, that, that's why we all love your books because that happens. So now yeah. um, we're going to do a little wrap up. And um, Carrie, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to tell them all about your goodie bundle and then I'm going to share a slide to tell everyone, show everyone where to go get it. Um, so, as mentioned earlier, Carrie has very generously donated six of the following Aussie-themed, Australian-themed goodie bundles which she'll send anywhere in the world, anywhere. So donate to us, go to our Indiegogo page, uh, look through the list of perks on the right hand side and click to donate the to fulfill the donation request and it's 
we set it at a very reasonable 85 US dollars because there's tons of goodies there, tons. And Carrie's gonna show it to you now. So here we go. So Carrie has uh, in her bundle, her down under goodie bundle, she has a signed copy of Wicked Embers. There you go. And a signed copy of City of Light. And uh, we know from uh, Carrie's Facebook page that some of you have been having uh, trouble getting a copy of City of Light. So here's a chance to get a signed and personalized copy of City of Light straight from Carrie. Carrie will send it straight to you. And a packet of the legendary Australian chocolate biscuit tin, uh, cookie tin tans, which uh, Carrie doesn't have with her right now. <laughs> <Not kidding. laughs> yeah, Carrie's going to create new Tim Tam addicts. Oh, this is great. Um, and an Aussie bookmark with a koala on it. It's, it hasn't arrived yet. Carrie's, Carrie has an order. And a purple bag that has a koala in front. You see it? A koala motif in front. And the bag is, um, it's got a stylized eucalyptus leaf motif. And um, once you finish doing it, I think you can sort of uh, fold it up and, and do a small thing and just tuck it away. And a button. Uh, and the really cute thing about this that no other author is offering is the <laughs> cute little koala soft toy plushie as small as you squeeze it. <laughs> Kelly, is this like a real koala snoring? Like, I don't think they've recorded it. <laughs> I actually don't know. They're usually too high in the tree to see. <laughs> they have to sleep a lot, don't they? Koala? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch back to me and I'm going to put the, the, the slide on the screen so all of you can see where to go to get all these goodies. It's going to be great. Okay, so I present to everyone. Hi, everyone. Yes, this is what I look like if you haven't seen me earlier. Um, so let's do screen share. Here we go. Can you see it, Carrie? Yep, I can see it. Okay, so everybody look at it. We've got um, free links there. So donate for geeky goodies, including Carrie's awesome down under goodie bundle uh, on Indiegogo. Go to is.gd slash r4p indiegogo iwd2016 and it's case sensitive. So make sure that you make sure that you type everything in uh, upper lowercase as presented here. If you're on PayPal, you can go to is.gd stroke r4p rezu iwd2016. Now, if you have PayPal only and you want a bundle, please email us to let us know that you are putting in the $85 via PayPal there and we will and we will uh, see if we can get we, we can get you a bundle it's up on Indiegogo so um, we can you know we will need to be able to change the number of bundles available on Indiegogo if you want if you want to pay by PayPal via Rizu and you want a bundle and you can find out more about Reaper Pixels, which is this current campaign that we're running together with Carrie and 10 other authors at is.gd slash read for pixels. That's is.gd stroke read for pixels. And let's go back to this. And um, you can, um, and uh, one more thing is uh, when you donate, we will also send you an ebook copy of On the Loom of the Fates, which is a collection of poems taking on sexism and misogyny in classical Greek and Roman myth by Gwendin Alexander. And she's a New Orleans based poet and a survivor of childhood abuse. So she's very bravely put her work out there, and it's everyone who's read it loves it. And if and if you want to find out more about violence against women and what you can do about it, go to our website at www.thepixelproject.net. And if you want to find out more about the Celebrity Male Role Model Pixel Reveal campaign, which this campaign is benefiting, please visit reveal.thepixelproject.net. And please do get, donate generously to help us reveal pixels and raise the $1 million for the cost. Now, I'm going to put Carrie back on screen because Carrie's got a very special announcement to make for everybody. To everybody hang on there you go carry up over to you now your announcement 
I uh, just want to thank everyone for coming along today and hope you continue to support the, the Pixel project. And also I just want to say that my next book coming out is the sequel to Wicked Embers and it's called Flame Out and it'll be out in July. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So now let's say, I guess we'll both of us to say thank you to everybody and have a good day or good night or good afternoon because all of you are spread out everywhere, wherever you are in the world. And remember to visit our Indiegogo page because there's so many really awesome goodies there. Carrie's is listed right at the top of the descriptions. You will have to go to the sidebar and scroll down till you reach Carrie's one and just click there and just donate to us. And Carrie will send you this treat. It's, you know, imagine this. Imagine a rainy day rainy Sunday, you've got nothing to do, you've got Carrie's two books, you don't need to go to Amazon to keep searching for City of Light like some of you have been doing. Um, and it's signed and personalized to you by Carrie and you have a packet of 10 times chocolate covered biscuits, cookies with you and you have the koala and you have your bookmark and you have your bag and you have the koala to keep you company and make you laugh. Great way to spend the Sunday. So go get it. And you know, enjoy yourself while at the same time helping the car. So we'll bid you good night now. Bye everybody. Bye. Good afternoon. Whatever. Thanks for coming.